a big round of applause and welcoming over to the stage right now, Gordon Matthews. Gordon, you probably gonna do it without a microphone, right? My voice is really loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. One more big round of applause for Gordon Matthews. Hi, as uh, Mark just said, I'm an anthropology professor and I have been investigating issues of Hong Kong identity for the last 25 or 30 years. Today I'm not going to go directly into research because I've got 20 minutes and I want to make this relatively brief. But I will try to give you a picture of where Hong Kong identity has been and where it's going. First of all, the theme of the month is native. But native is a really curious term in a Hong Kong context because it refers to indigenous villagers in the new territories. That's partly a political creation because ever since 1898, uh, those who are descended from one of the people deemed an original inhabitant of a village in the new territories has the right to build a house. And that's a tremendous financial benefit. So Hung Yi Cook, the Hong Kong organization, does everything it can to preserve the, uh, the political benefits of being a new territories villager. But in fact, new territories villagers are no different from those who live in Central or anywhere else. You know, a number of them are bankers in Central and so on. They really aren't different. Sometimes my, my foreign students say, I want to go find an indigenous Hong Konger, a native Hong Konger. And they go to the New Territories villages, and yeah, architecturally they may look interesting if they are one of these walled villages, but they really are a different matter altogether from Maoris, for example, or First Nation peoples in Canada and so on. It, it's quite different. There used to be Tonka, Hakka, various groups in Hong Kong, and maybe you are yourself, I'm not sure, but now really they're almost gone. So I don't want to talk about that right now. I might mention that for the uh, indigenous New Territories uh, uh, villagers, one big interesting problem has been that the descent comes through the male line. So in the last few decades, women have initiated lawsuits. Hey, why can't we build a new house? Why can't we inherit property? And they haven't really gone anywhere. So that's a fascinating issue, but it's a little bit narrower and more specific than what I want to talk about today, which is Hong Kong identity. What is a Hong Konger? And what is a native in this context? It's confusing because almost everybody in Hong Kong, except for the people I've just talked about, have come from somewhere else. Their grandparents, their parents, they themselves have come probably from mainland China, but from many other places as well. So who can be a Hong Konger? Now, up until the late 1960s and 1970s, a sense of separate Hong Kong identity really didn't exist. There were occasional political movements in Guangzhou and Canton against the British colonizers, and Hong Kong would just copy them, like the 1922 Seamen Strike, for example. Up until 1940, there wasn't even a border, a, a politically demarcated border between Hong Kong and China. So the idea of a separate Hong Kong identity w was, would have been pretty much unthinkable for most people in Hong Kong in that earlier era. The transformation really came about in the 1960s and 70s when Hong Kong began developing on its own and when the Cultural Revolution closed off the mainland. Hong Kongers for the first time began thinking, hey, we're different from those people in the mainland and attitudes towards the mainland shifted. It used to be that when people escaped the mainland, they would be welcomed in Hong Kong, but for the first time, a degree of antipathy set in, a degree of difference. And this was crystallized in the 1967 riots in Hong Kong, when a number of bombs went off, sent, set off by uh, uh, participants in the Cultural Revolution in China of its various factions. And they expected Hong Kongers to join with them in rebellion against their British masters, but that didn't happen. Instead, the British were supported more than the, the Maoist uh, Chinese bombers here. And that was quite a shock, and it led to the beginning of this new sense of Hong Kong identity. Now, the Hong Kong identity at first was what the scholar, former scholar Lao Siu Kai called utilitarian familism. That's a technical term. But what it means is, as, as he put it, Hong Kong identity is based on people who had fled the mainland, fled you know, the, the Chinese Revolution of the late 1940s, the Great Leap Forward of the 1950s, the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, to try to establish their lives in Hong Kong, simply working, staying out of politics, and supporting their families. That's what he meant by this term, not political. Totally different from Hong Kong of 40 years later. Uh, very interesting, but that's what he, he, the term he coined. Now, Hong Kong identity began shifting in the late 80s to popular culture. 
First of all, there was, of course, Bruce Lee in the 1970s. And ask around the world, Hong Kong, many people I know would say, Bruce Lee, Kung Fu, and so on. But then by the 90s, you had Wong Kar Wai, Chunking Express, Happy Together, and so on. You had Anita Mui, Fei Wong, the four kings of canto pop, you know, Andy Lau, Aaron Kwok, oh, I've forgotten names, Leon Lai. Anyway, you know, that was what Hong Kong was seen. People around the world knew Hong Kong for its popular culture. But then protests. And I first came to Hong Kong in 1994. And I remember in 2003, when the first major protest erupted against uh, Tong Chi Hua, the first Hong Kong chief executive, with 500,000 people in the streets. And I began thinking, I thought Hong Kong was not political. What's going on here? Why is this happening? Then again, in 2005, a much bigger demonstration. Then really, ever since, 2014, the Umbrella Movement, 2019, the Anti-Extradition Bill. You know all this. You've been here. You've seen what went on. And the interesting question is, why? Why did all this happen? And I think it's because the sense of Hong Kong identity beginning in the late 60s and 1970s was of a Hong Kong different from China. It was, we are not the same as the mainland. We're a different people. And the sense was the Hong Kong government was trying to make Hong Kong fit in with China. It was emphasizing one country more than two systems. And whatever the specific cause of protest, that was the underlying issue. We are Hong Kongers. That's what many of the protesters wanted to say. Now, as all of you know, that era is done. We have the national security law, and it would be crazy for anybody to protest about this kind of thing today. That's gone. And so the really interesting question is, can there be a new sense of cultural identity that is not political? I think it's fair to say that the first two decades of the 20th century, Hong Kong identity was based on protest. I remember every weekend there was a different protest. And I knew a number of students who, instead of doing anything else, would go to a protest every weekend. They wouldn't come here. They'd be out on the streets. But that era is done. So where do you find that new sense of Hong Kong identity? Some of my students will insist that Hong Kong identity can only continue outside of Hong Kong in places like London, places like Melbourne, places like Tokyo, places like Taipei. And it will be Hong Kongers remembering uh, the de democracy movement. But I get kind of angry at some of those students because they're not inclusive enough. I mean, you might not like somebody like Carrie Lam, but was she a Hong Konger? Yes, of course. Hong Kong identity is not only for the yellow cap, it's for people who are Hong Kongers, regardless of their political convictions. That's as silly as in an American context saying only Republicans can be Americans or only Democrats can be Americans. No, it's not inclusive enough. So that if we're trying to think about this place, Hong Kong, where can a new identity come from? Well, there are various ways it could emerge. One conceivably might be music. I know a jazz musician who loves making compositions based on the MTR. And he makes these piano compositions with the MTR announcements in them and, and the way the trains sound. Now, he says, I'm going to make a new Hong Kong identity. No, he won't. Nobody likes jazz. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, interesting idea. Um, in a broader sense, the band Mirror, which I have no use for, but I know enough young Hong Kongers who say, this is who I am. Oh, Mirror, oh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, also, a new sense of identity could come from Hong Kong design. You know, the M Plus Museum is wonderful for some of its Hong Kong exhibits. There really is a sense of Hong Kong in that kind of design. Or even in something else like NGOs. You know, I think that's what you guys are engaged in. Many people here, Mark, and that's what you're talking about. Uh, these movements, too, continue Hong Kong as a vibrant civil society without this political tinge that has existed in most NGOs. Or even something like nature. When I first came to Hong Kong, the country parks had very few people in them. Now. Damn, I climbed Lion Rock last week, and you can't get a step in edgewise. You've got to get in line. Nature might be what Hong Kong is. So there's a lot of ways that a new Hong Kong identity could conceivably emerge. I don't know, but maybe. I'm, I'm guessing here. But then there's another interesting question here to bring up. What's the relation of Hong Kong cultural identity to national identity? Now, some mainland students I know well uh, tell me that Hong Kong can conceivably become like Shanghai. If you speak to a, a Shanghai uh, mainland student, she will often say, or he will often say, you know, of course I'm Chinese, but Shanghai is what I really love. Shanghai is my home. It's different from everybody else in China. And they might say we're better than everybody else in China. But anyway, you get the idea here. That can be a form of identity. And could Hong Kong develop the same kind of identity, being indisputably Chinese, 
which we all now know, but still being what they've always said, a bridge between China and the world, between East and West. Can this maintain, be maintained as a source of identity? Um, the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, that many in Hong Kong see Hong Kong identity as intrinsically opposed to China. In one of my earlier writings on Hong Kong identity, I wrote about Hong Kong as having these two tracks, Hong Kong as a part of China and Hong Kong as apart from China. And I think many young Hong Kongers today, most of my Hong Kong students, think of Hong Kong as apart from China. They don't want to be that part of China. And often when they talk about this, they speak of Cantonese. We speak Cantonese, we don't speak Putonghua. But the problem with that argument is 60 million people in Guangdong province speak Cantonese. So you too are Chinese. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You, you see this here. They say, our Cantonese is different. How? We mix English in with our Cantonese. OK, maybe so. But still, that's not really a very sound argument for talking about Hong Kong as different from China. But there is one key difference that I found in my own research between Hong Kong and China. And let me get a little bit academic here, but it's, it's pretty important. There are two forms of national identity, of belonging to your country. One of these is ethnic. And the ethnic form of identity is particularly the case in Japan, Korea, and China, where it's a matter of blood. It's a matter of, of you know, the family you belong to. Um, Japanese is my best foreign language, much better than my Cantonese. But if I tell my Japanese friends, I'm Japanese they will look at me like I'm completely crazy. They'll laugh. You can't be Japanese. You're a foreigner. Now, legally, I can be Japanese. You know, my, my wife is Japanese, so I, I could get Japanese citizenship over a long period. But socially, it's impossible. No, because Japan is for Japanese, people of Japanese race, if we can use the term. Korea is like that, too, although there's more and more intermarriage in Korea between Koreans and foreigners, so that identity is being diluted. China, a little bit less than uh, Japan and Korea, but in China, too. I asked my mainland students, if my Putonghua was perfect, could I be Chinese? No. But Hong Kong has been shifting. Hong Kong, that's not quite the case. Now, aside from ethnic identity, there's another form of identity known as civic identity. And that's not like belonging to a family. It's like belonging to a club. Canada is a good example of this. Um, Brazil is another example of this, where you, know, you can become Canadian regardless of your physical appearance. Now, is there racism in Canada? Absolutely. And the US is another example of this. Of course there's racism. Is civic identity good and ethnic identity bad? Of course not. But having said that, it is a different basis of belonging. Um, my Japanese friends can become Canadian, but I can't become Japanese because the basis is that belonging to a club rather than belonging to a family. My contention is that Hong Kong is changing. It used to be based on ethnic identity. Now it's based much more on civic identity. When I first came to Hong Kong 30 years ago, I remember how excruciating it was talking to some young students. They'd come into my office and, no, hey, don't be afraid. I've never spoken to a foreigner before. And then, I mean, I spoke rudimentary Cantonese at that point, so I'd say, look, let's speak Cantonese. Well, I've still never spoken to a foreigner before. And your Cantonese is bad. So yeah, that's what would happen. But, but it was really tough often. But it changed quite drastically over the last 25 years. And there's one really interesting element of that change. Uh, one event that really shook me, or, or sh really shook my perceptions of what Hong Kong is. I have taught a class in Chunking Mansions for the last, oh, 20 years. And it's a class of asylum seekers. Uh, but other people come too. Americans come, Hong Kong Chinese come, mainland Chinese come, anybody who's interested comes. And so it's a real melting pot of people. And I remember one day in 2017, a Hong Kong localist came to the class. And I remember vividly a Pakistani asylum seeker came up to the Hong Kong localist and said, can I be a Hong Konger? And the localist said, of course you can be a Hong Konger. We love people like you. We need people like you in Hong Kong. Then an asylum seeker from Nigeria came up to the localist and said, can I be a Hong Konger? And the localist said, of course you can be a Hong Konger. We need people like you. We love people like you. And then my mainland student came up to him and said, can I be a Hong Konger? He just looked down. <laughs> he wouldn't answer her. But the implicit answer is no. Now, how weird this is. It used to be that only somebody ethnically Chinese would really be a Hong Konger. But what this localist was saying was the exact opposite. Anybody can be a Hong Konger except somebody who is from the mainland. 
No, this is racist. And it, whether you're prejudiced against Indians, against uh, Africans, against whites, against uh, ethnic Chinese, it's all prejudice. So that has to be remembered. But this is what we see. We do see this shift in what Hong Kong has become. Now, why has this change take place? One reason it's take place is simply the government's heavy-handedness. And I remember from 1997 on, constantly that message, you are Chinese, you belong to China. And given the shaping of Hong Kong identity I've described earlier, uh, obviously many Hong Kongers would say, hey, wait a second, we have one country, two systems, and don't only emphasize one country, we also have our Hong Kong difference. And that's certainly one root of what I've been talking about, the sense of being separate from the mainland. But there's another reason, too, that I think is really important academically, but, but I think important, very important to understand about what makes Hong Kong so unique. All of you here, unless you're a Hong Konger, have a sense of a country you belong to. It is your country, and you may love it instinctively, even though you don't like its leaders. You've been taught that way. You belong to a country. Hong Kong hasn't. There's no sense of belonging to a country because of its long history as a colony. I remember vividly another interview I did roughly around 210 with, uh, I do these interviews often with a mainland Chinese student, uh, an American student, and a Hong Kong student, just to compare what they're going to say. And I asked the mainland student, do you love your country? Oh, of course I love my country. Can you sing a little bit of the national anthem? And she did with great pride. Then I asked the American, do you love your country? Well, I don't like the president very much, but yeah, I, I like America. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of like that. But then I said to her, can you say the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, which I still remember from you know, my many years of saying that in school. And then the Hong Kong student looked at the American and looked at the Chinese and said, you Americans are just like the Chinese. <laughs> And what she didn't understand is that people everywhere have a country, and they, they learn these symbols of the country, and have some basic liking or loving for their country. And the Hong Kong student just didn't understand this. Now, some people could argue that Hong Kongers aren't blind to ways of patriotism, as other people are, maybe. Other people could argue, no, Hong Kongers are simply blind in that everybody else can see because they have a national identity. Hong Kongers haven't, and it's about time they learn national identity. One could argue either way. But it's really interesting thinking about this change and what's happened here. Um, now, with the national security law, all of this has shifted. And Hong Kongers will indeed be learning to become Chinese. Maybe not this generation. I think my generation of students now, still remembering the 2019 protest, probably always will, in private, not feel like they're Chinese. Their children will. Their children will learn they're a part of China. I think this is pretty much inevitable. This is what's going on. And in one sense, you know, um, one could say, too bad, because there are less freedoms in China. On the other hand, it is natural for people to have a country to belong to, and Hong Kongers have them. So then, the final topic here, what will Hong Kong become? What is the future of this city that we love? Many in Hong Kong, many of those who belong to the yellow camp would say, Hong Kong will become just one more Chinese city. It will be no different, not just from Shanghai or Beijing, but from Wuhan, Chongqing, all kinds of Chinese cities. It won't have its uniqueness anymore. But others say, no, we still can have a unique and distinct Hong Kong, one that is a bridge between China and the world. Hong Kong can continue. Now, recent commentators that you have probably read have said Hong Kong is over. There was one economic analysis, I think, last week that said, hey, the Hong Kong stock market since 1997 has not boomed the way it was in the past. Hong Kong's days are numbered. It is basically finished. Um, those looking at 2019, I myself was deeply discouraged by 2019, both in terms of the students and the degree of violence they practice towards property, and in terms of the national security law, which is somewhat draconian. But one good point about Hong Kong to remember is that these protests, if they had been elsewhere, would have killed hundreds of people. In Hong Kong, nobody directly died. In America, damn, both sides would have had guns. You'd have had hundreds of people killed. And so even in the midst of protests, you had this wonderful Hong Kong civility that did continue, oh, which is, is quite remarkable. That, that it remains, I think. And this, not just the issue of the lack of violence, but general, my sense of Hong Kong as a whole, makes me a real optimist because despite, a, part, a guarded optimist, because despite 
what I read in newspapers. Despite stock market plunges and so on, Hong Kong in daily life and daily interactions remains an extraordinary place. This is pretty much the same place as it was when I first came here in terms of just the daily interactions with people. You know, it, it is a quite wonderful place, and, and I love living here, so I myself hope to die here as a Hong Konger. Thank you. If you guys have another hour, I'm just going <laughs> to... Um, Thank you very much. That was captivating. That was a great, great story. Uh, I love how you use different angles to, uh, to look at this. And I'm sure that there are some questions from the audience. Uh, I would love for you to not necessarily share a big opinion or tell your side of the story. But if you have a question uh, or a point that you want to <laughs> let, <laughs> let Gordon discuss, I'm more than happy to, uh, yeah, to hear from you. Although, so, give your opinion, too. Arguments are fun. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Having lived here so long, it's clear that you regard yourself as a Hong Konger now. So what do you think the steps are for foreigners in Hong Kong to become Hong Kongers? Is it a length of time or are there added bits that sort of make them regard themselves or other people see them as Hong Kongers? Okay, that's a good point. Um, I didn't try that hard. A lot of it was just the circumstances in which I've been in. I teach at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but it could be Hong Kong U for that matter. But the point is, my students are mostly Hong Kong Chinese. And I've taught them for generation after generation, really. Uh, so uh, one of the great joys I feel in Hong Kong is, you know, I'm on the MTR. And somebody will come up to me and say, you taught me in that class back in 2007. Don't you remember me? Well, sorry, um, no. <laughs> but, but I really enjoyed that class. And I asked, what do you do now? Oh, now I have three kids and I'm working as a nurse. You know, great. I mean, I can find out. It's, it's so great to have this ongoing sense of community. That makes me feel like a Hong Konger. Now, um, I have, to be honest with you, had problems with Cantonese because of my face. You know, uh, with students, I've tried to pay them to speak Cantonese to me. But they look at my face and say, why don't we just speak English? And so it's rather difficult. My, my most fun in Hong Kong is riding taxis, because there I get to speak Cantonese for 10 minutes. On campus, no. If I speak Cantonese, students just laugh at me and reply in English. So that is an ongoing problem, although I do speak some. Um, another point that made me a Hong Konger was what happened in some of the protests where I began to be identified as a Hong Konger. But the politics get in the way. Um, I don't think that only yellows can be Hong Kongers, and I did an interview a couple of years ago where it was the yellow camp that really got angry at me. I mean, I said something that maybe I shouldn't have said, but I said I, would, I, I dislike both Xi Jinping and Donald Trump, but I'd rather have Xi Jinping as my ruler than Donald Trump. Well, that made very many people very angry. So um, obviously, I, I'm, I'm not a Hong Konger in that sense, but in a broader sense of simply loving the Hong Kong community, being here, and being accepted by an awful lot of Hong Kongers just because I have taught them or their parents or their children, that makes me feel this way. And I, I can't answer your question directly because I don't know what anybody could do. I mean, some of you may work in Central in, a, a, say, a, a bank that is mostly foreign. Uh, some of you, it depends on the particular s world you're in. You know, and particularly the world on Hong Kong Island often does seem like a, a guaylo bubble, Lam Kwai Fong and so on, or at least it used to be, less so now. Um, so that's a big factor. And then another factor making me feel like a Hong Konger is chunking mansions, which really is my second home. I mean, I'm still there all the time. And that, to me, is Hong Kong and the world more than anywhere else. So that's a long, rambling answer, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Language is one part, being here for a long time, and also giving back to the community is something that's really important. Yeah, in all of these. And just liking people. I mean, I find that um, I really, really like Hong Kong students because um, many of the American students, not so, some of them are excellent students, but others, I mean, they're here for the sake of Lam Kwai Fong and getting laid. Sorry, that's crazy <laughs> cool, but I think I can say that. Um, Hong Kong kids are often quite serious. They might not be intellectually brilliant, but they're so earnest and wanting to learn new ideas that it's just a real joy to teach in class and have people say, wait, wait. And then if they argue with me, great. But I find it really wonderful to have that interaction. And that's shaped my love for this place. I'm, I'm shocked because I'm, I'm originally a Japan specialist. And I'd expected to be living my life in Japan, not in Hong Kong. 
but I was offered a job early in my career back in Kyoto. Kyoto, what a wonderful place to live. And I chose Hong Kong. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. It was very interesting. I'm just curious. Uh, if you've seen any noticeable changes since 2019 in terms of freedom of speech or any impact on your profession and how you can voice your opinions? Um, there are quite considerable changes, obviously. Um, in fact, so much so that I wondered what I could say here, but uh, I went ahead and said it anyway. I have been told by my university that as long as I teach using critical thinking, in other words, giving different points of view, fine. Uh, I teach a class called Cultures of Hong Kong, and we do talk about the protests, and one question I ask of students is, talk about the 2019 protests from at least four different perspectives. You know, a mainland Chinese perspective, uh, an American perspective, a blue perspective, a yellow perspective, and any other perspective you want. But give all sides, really. And I think that's what learning should be. Um, it seems that the national security law does not, it specifically prohibits certain expressions of opinion. But I think it still allows this kind of critical thinking. That's my interpretation of it, and I hope it continues. Now, um, I'm concerned about the future. I don't know what Article 23, which John Lee is talking about passing, is going to bring. But I'm, again, cautiously optimistic Hong Kong will continue, uh, particularly in English. In Cantonese, less so. But uh, something like the Hong Kong Free Press continues to be rather free in what it can say. And I'm, I'm impressed by that. So I'm hoping that will continue and that the kind of stuff I'm saying, I mean, I love Hong Kong. I would think any government would be happy to have somebody like me here. Uh, so I'm hoping that will continue. And I, I think it will, but I'm not sure. Thanks. So, sorry. I guess that's actually related. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the origin of the difference between the civic and the familial um, uh, cultures? Because, I mean, language seems to be an obvious one. Um, but equally, you know, for Japanese people, Chinese might be quite accessible at the other way around. So yeah. I wonder, where does that come from and why is it so different? Um, that's a really complicated question. Uh, but the, the very idea of a nation is pretty new in history. I mean, it's only a matter, really, of the last 300 years or even 200, 250 years by some interpretations. So when a given country says, our blood, we've had the blood of our Japanese nation from time immemorial, well, no, that's a recent creation. And this whole sense of belonging, too, is that. Now, it's been steadily changing in history from ethnic to civic. I think of a place like Sweden which, you know, you know what Swedes look like. That was always pretty ethnically based. But last time I was in Sweden, an anthropologist took me to the Somali and Syrian neighborhood there. And I could see how shocked he was. This is Sweden? Yes, it is now. It's shifting because more and more people are coming in. Basically, intermarriage leads to a shift from ethnic to civic. And everywhere there is intermarriage. People don't marry only within their own ethnic group. So there has been that shift. And so rather than answer, discuss the origin, I'm trying to think more of the future. And even in a place like Japan, which is one of the most ethnically based places around, it can't continue for too long because you can't control love. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to keep trying, though. <laughs> OK, I think we have time for one more. Oh, this person was waiting. Right there. Yeah. It was quite a comfort to like the remark was, that was about freedom of speech. So I was a teacher in a local school until two years ago. Yeah. And do you think, given uh, I've seen firsthand what national security education looks like, and I'm not as optimistic as you do, no. because what do you think will happen with these children who are being taught to Chinese and without any critical thinking, right? Like, because obviously you don't have the same perspective as an academic, right, and yeah, dealing yeah. with all the children, but the, what about the indoctrination? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can use that word. Well, okay, and, and good question, but indoctrination doesn't work a lot of the time. Now, on the mainland, it works a little better, but even on the mainland, I mean, uh, is this being recorded? I guess I'll say it anyway. I probably can. I mean, I taught a class of, of uh, online of mainland students, one tutorial of mainland students. I had maybe 25 mainland students, and I realized Every one of them, growing up in the mainland, they'd never been to Hong Kong, was more critical of China than I was as an American. So, I mean, critical thinking does continue, and people don't get totally indoctrinated. Now, with me, um, 
I remember you, you must be American, and I feel the same way. I mean, if somebody comes up to me in a bar late at night and says, I hate your country, that's disgusting, would I be upset? Maybe. But, I mean, I have a lot of critical thinking towards America. I think I can honestly say I really dislike America's foreign policy. It may be the biggest bully in the world. So, I mean, I can make these statements. I'm not indoctrinated, even though there's a slight little bit of me that still thinks I'm American and, and has a, a faith in that, really. So I think Hong Kong kids will continue that. Now, I am not sure. I don't know how it's going to change. Part of the big difference is secondary school has had significantly more obstacles in Hong Kong, and I know other teachers like you who have quit, than universities. A Chinese university is ranked you know, pretty high in the world, 45th or something like that. And I think the biggest nightmare of the people who run the university is, are we going to lose all that we've worked in keeping us high in ranking? So they, they do want to preserve critical thinking. What's going to happen, we don't yet know. And I'm guardedly optimistic, but God knows what may happen. Uh, we both might wind up in jail. I doubt it very seriously, but you just don't know what can happen. Uh, but still, uh, I mean, I'm an innate optimist, so maybe that's why. And, and I can't say that I'm right, but all I can say is so far so good. One last comment to make here is my students, uh, I sometimes ask them, what was the worst year in Hong Kong's last century? And they will say 2019 or 2020. I say, no, total nonsense. It was 1942, 1941, when the Japanese came in and you had thousands of Hong Kongers killed, tortured to death. You know, you had just massive war going on, or it might have been in a later year when you had bubonic plague and so on. There are these other times that were far worse. So I, I want them to remember that. It's not as big as they may think. And I also bring up that issue of civility. Um, I remember one final moment I have to give you. I remember when my own campus was erupting in protests and I saw a huge barrier of police. And I, I was there just to watch what was going on and I went up to the police and said, it just started staring at them. And a policeman left the barrier and said, why are you staring at us? And I said, I don't want you to do bad things to my students. And then he said, well, we won't do bad things to your students unless they do bad things to us. And I thought, that's a fairly civil conversation to have at a time when tear gas was being thrown and so on. And, and that gave me, again, that idea of civility that did continue. Uh, I keep thinking back to the American context where people would have pulled out guns. That didn't happen. So again, you may call me ridiculously, insufferably optimistic, but at least from my position, I, can, I feel like I can retain some of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Gordon Matthew. <laughs>